Hello and welcome to this Royal Society videocast. I'm Wendy Barnaby and today I'll be talking to Professor Partha Dasgupta of the Faculty of Economics at Cambridge University. He's written an article in the 350th anniversary issue of Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society B and it's called Nature's Role in Sustaining Economic Development. It's about the way economists think about sustainable development. Now, Professor Dasgupta, you contend that the current way of thinking about economic development is flawed because it doesn't take natural capital into account. So what do you mean by natural capital? Yes, the, um, if you ask an economist what kinds of assets are involved in production in an economy, he, would, uh, he or she would uh, mention reproducible capital, manufactured capital goods like buildings, roads, machines. Uh, equipment. You will also introduce the notion of human capital, skills, education, health, because better health, better education creates more output. It's more productive, so that's another kind of capital asset. Then, of course, there's the more abstract kind of capital assets which, are, which the Royal Society is so good at producing. Knowledge. Uh, it's not tangible, but of course it makes things happen. But mostly we economists have ignored natural capital, by which I mean all that stuff out there in nature which produces goods for us. Ecosystems, for example, coral reefs in particular, mangroves, farmland. Farmland is included. Uh, it's sort of almost inevitable. But uh, many of the services that farms produce, or farmland produces, forests produce, are not taken into You mentioned account. forests there, so let's think about how this might work in practice. If you had a government that allowed private companies to fell timber in forests at the head of the uplands in a watershed, how at the moment would we take into account the value of those services that the timber would provide? Typically we don't. It's the timber that's, uh, a price is attributed to the timber as log, building material, so if it's exported, I mean, the ex example you've given is very telling because Malaysia is deforesting in a big way, as is Indonesia, in the uplands. And much of the timber goes exported to countries like China, some to India maybe. But the price that is tagged to the timber is the log value, if you like, the value of the log as building material. But the forest, of course, is producing many other things besides just these trees. The trees themselves protect the soil. That, in turn, um, protects downland farmers or downstream farmers, fishermen downstream. Um, each of them, each tree, contributes very little, but the totality of trees can play a significant role. And that service, the ones that uh, the downstream farmers enjoy, um, is not taken into account when the uh, costs and benefits are estimated about the value of a forest. And so we're selling those trees. Um, we're, we're in fact underpricing those trees when we sell them. We are underpricing those trees. And uh, the irony of it is that it's, if it's an export example, then it's in effect a uh, transfer of wealth from the exporting country to the importing country. And what's worse is that some of this wealth is really those that are, that is, enjoyed by, or owned, if you like, by some of the poorest people in the country, in the, country the farmers downstream or the fishermen downstream. So it's a very odd, uh, I think, unacceptable state of affairs. So how might we make a better job of all this? I mean, if you take sustainable development as your goal, how might that influence the way that we calculate national wealth? Well, there are two types of questions one wants to ask. What should be done? That's one class of questions we always ask. Another is, what's going on? How do we assess whether things are all right or not? The latter set of questions is, uh, are, is, is, is uh, concerns sustainable development. So when you ask whether development is sustainable, you're not asking, should we accept this project or reject that policy? You're asking, how is the world doing? Or how is the country doing? Or how is the region doing? Or how, how is the household doing? The units of uh, the economic unit could be one of anything, actually. Um, 
So the question is, what index do you look at, study, to see whether uh, things are not winding down, so to speak? And uh, what some of us have shown is that the right index is not GDP. It's far from it. It's something like the wealth of a nation. And to estimate the wealth, you estimate not only the stock of manufactured capital and human capital, but also natural capital. So you need a pricing tech process uh, by which you attribute a value to uh, the various types of natural capital and include that in your estimation of wealth. And correcting for population growth, you ask yourself the question whether wealth is increasing or decreasing under business as usual. Of course, you can next ask, well, I'm not interested in business as usual. I want to change things. And what kind of policy should we go for? Well, the answer turns out to be the same. To, namely, ask yourself whether wealth increases by the policy that you're recommending. If it does, then that's a good policy. If it doesn't, it's not. And this notion of wealth is very inclusive. So that's why we call it inclusive wealth. That it includes not only the kinds of capital assets that economists typically talk about, but in particular, in this context, nature has to be included. So understanding that our goal is sustainable development, how could we factor in the value of nature in a more precise way? Well, bear, recall that when we say something should be sustained, we, must, we, we mean that that object should not decline over time. And I've been suggesting that the index that we ought to be estimating is wealth, an inclusive measure of wealth. So in the case, the, the problematic cases arise in the context of natural capital because the prices, as we noticed earlier, the prices that reveal themselves are not capturing the value, the, the worth, the social worth of those objects. But from every example, you can work out what's missing. And the trick is to try and figure out how to estimate that bit which is missing. So take the case that you started with. You have these farmers who are, say, the downstream farmers who are subsidizing the export. And you ask, what's the subsidy amount to? The natural thing to ask is, what is the productivity loss that these farmers are suffering from owing to the deforestation? And that loss, if you can estimate it, should be included in the value of the object that's being exported. So when you do that, then the price of the object that's being exported is, of course, lower than the market price. Therefore, declines in the capital asset becomes more, it could be even be a negative uh, quantity. Uh, so for example, the price that of the export could be negative even though the market price is positive. If the loss to the farmers exceeds the price that you, uh, the, the loggers receive from the export, so there are many, many such examples, but every one of them can in principle be tackled. Of course, in practice, some are extremely difficult and beyond a point, we probably won't be able to do it. So how do you value the spotted owl? It's anybody's guess. But for many, many objects out there, particularly in the third world, um, these natural capital is not, they're not really amenities, they are means of production. Uh, so the wetlands, for example, they offer services. And it's in principle possible to find out, determine the worth of it in an approximate way, and that should be included. You've calculated the national wealth of some developing countries, taking the subsidy to nature into account. And what did you find? Well, the news is bad, even although uh, these estimates were very crude, inevitably, and they were very partial. But I'll come back to the partial nature of it in a minute. Uh, the the natural, kinds of natural capital I included are forests um, and um, carbon in the atmosphere, whose price is, of course, negative because it's, uh, any increase is seen as detrimental, particularly in poor countries, and oil and natural gas. Leave that aside for the moment. We have then an estimate which excludes many of the ecosystem services that we are talking about. Uh, fisheries aren't accounted for, soil erosion, atmospheric pollution, those are missed out, okay? So we have an underestimate. Nevertheless, 
um, I found that you take a range of plausible values for carbon in the atmosphere, uh, value of forests, uh, the uh, per capita wealth corrected, wealth corrected for population growth has actually declined in South Asian countries and, of course, sub-Saharan African countries. South Asia is interesting because if you look at the statistics of their GDP, uh, even if correcting for population, they've all been rising. So staring at those statistics would suggest that the development path has been pretty good. But if you look at wealth per head, uh, they seem to have declined over the last 30 years. But if I may come back to the, the, what the missing items, um, sometimes when you know the direction in which the missing items would go, then missing them actually reinforces your conclusion. It doesn't um, conflict with them because we have reasons to believe that many of these ecosystem services have gone down, although we haven't measured them. And uh, we also have reason to believe that atmospheric pollutants have increased, although we haven't measured them. Now, if each of those components is a negative input into the wealth changes, and it's already negative, then what you're missing out are some negative terms. So if you had included them, things would have looked even worse. Okay. So what do you conclude? That we should have been valuing nature? We should have been taking nature seriously for a long time. Uh, or since a long time. We've, uh, both development experts and government officials and political leaders have ignored nature. It's not been part of the agenda of uh, economic thinking. And I should say, my colleagues haven't taken it seriously either. So it's not as though the economists have been banging on about nature. Few of us have, though. Um, the theory, economic theory, taking nature into account is now in pretty good shape. Um, We've been working at it, a number of people, over the last 30 years. So the economics of natural capital is on a par with the economics of human capital and other things. And we've also integrated it with the rest so that we have a pretty comprehensive way of thinking about the progress and regress of nations and uh, how to assess policy. But the empirics of it uh, have lagged behind hugely through neglect. And uh, so we are about 30 years behind schedule. Thank you, Professor Dasgupta, very much indeed. Thank you, too, for watching. That's all from this Royal Society videocast. We hope you'll join us again.